Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Leviticus. It may be found in chapter 11, and the verses are 44 and 45. If you would like to follow in the Pew Bible, it's on pages 170 and 171. Listen to the word of the Lord. I am the Lord, your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. I am the Lord, who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy, because I am holy. <clears throat> and our second reading from the Gospel this morning, New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. These verses are found on pages 1,817 and 1,000. 818. <clears throat> Spiritual blessings in Christ. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavens, heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him <coughs> before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. <clears throat> Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. So ends our reading from the Bible today. This week we will be starting a sermon series on the book of Ephesians. This series will be interrupted just for a few weeks in late March and early April. As most of you probably know, the last Sunday in March is Palm Sunday, and then the Sunday after that, April 1st, is also Easter as well as April Fool's Day. And then after Easter, I will be out two weeks for study leave. 
So during that four week period, we will have an interruption of our Ephesians 5 or sermon series. Well, I will be covering all six chapters of Ephesians during this sermon series. I will not be covering every verse. Therefore, I would encourage all of you to read the verses that I'm skipping over during the week as part of your devotional time. For example, you can notice from the bulletin that I'm covering verses uh, 3 through 14 in chapter 1 of Ephesians this morning. Next week I will be covering Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10, which means, of course, that you should read verses 1 and 2 and then 15 through 23 of chapter 1 so that you get filled in on the blanks that I'm leaving out of my sermon series. Before starting today's discussion of our, our discussion on today's passage, I want to get two more administrative details out of the way. First of all, among biblical scholars, there is a great debate about whether or not Paul really wrote the letter of Ephesians. Now granted, if you read verse 1 of chapter 1, it clearly identifies that Paul is the apostle, or the apostle Paul is the author of this letter. However, there are some theologians who look at the letter of Ephesians and believe that it's actually written by a group of disciples of the Apostle Paul who wrote it in the style of Paul and then claim Pauline authorship in order to lend the letter more credibility. This was a common practice during biblical times. So if it did happen, it should not cause us any issues of trusting in the Bible. Well, at Fuller, the class on Ephesians that I took was taught by a professor by the name of Arpatia. This was going to be his last class that he was going to teach before he retired. And early in Professor Arpatia's career, he wrote that Paul indeed was the author of uh, the letter of Ephesians. And then near the end of his career, he wrote another book where he had a change of opinion. When I took that class, Dr. Patsia required all of us to do an oral presentation on different sections of Ephesians. But one thing that he required us to do was also take a stand on whether or not we believe Paul was the uh, actual author of this great letter. When it came time for me to give my oral presentation, you can probably guess where I felt. I declare that Pat, Professor Patsia should have followed the advice that I give all of my students, which is go with your first gut reaction unless you are effective or 100% clear you were wrong and that Professor Patsia in his more recent writings was incorrect. Whoa. Yeah, whoa. I, I had some students in the class saying, Steve, this is the week after you can drop this class. Do you really want to flunk? Well, as it turns out, I got either an A or a B in that class, even with my disagreeing with the professor's view. I tell this story as a way to demonstrate that in the big scheme of things, the authorship issue really isn't that critical for our purposes. But I pointed out to you, just because every now and then, I'll get a phone call from somebody who heard uh, a preacher get up and say, the writer of Ephesians, and they'll be all upset about Pastor Steve. Didn't Paul write Ephesians? And I go, why do you ask? And it's because they've heard somebody say, the writer of Ephesians, or something else that indicated that they do not believe Paul wrote the letter. And I just want you to know if you come across somebody who has that view, don't worry about it. It's something that uh, 
people who are trying to keep their job by publishing or perishing will publish web articles in order to keep their job in seminary. Please, let them keep writing those jobs. You really don't want them in the pulpit being your pastors. <laughs> the thing that we do have to remember, though, is the key part that we need to remember is that the Bible is the unique and the authoritative word of God. Therefore, it's not so important as to whether or not we can determine whether or not Paul really wrote the letter or not. But what we need to do is we need to understand what this letter says to us and then apply it to our lives. We can let the academics have their fun with debating the trivial issues of this letter, such as authorship. As we approach this letter of, or this passage of Ephesians, some of you who follow me on Facebook might know what one of my rants are, is already. In the Greek, or the Greek uh, original manuscript, verses 3 through 14 is a single 202 word sentence. Now, the NIV and some of the other English translations edit this passage into multiple set sentences, but the original Greek is one complete, complex sentence where Paul gets so caught up praising God, he lets his enthusiasm get in the way of writing in a style that would be more acceptable to those of us who like good grammatical sentences. One commentary that I read points out that Paul will write super long sentences seven more times in this letter to the Ephesians. And after seeing the references, I took a moment to look and see how many of the long sentences I'm going to preach on. This week, next week, and one other week, I will be preaching on one of the long sentences that are found in Ephesians. Now, I'm, that's not to say that whoever is just preaching for me on April 8th and 15th won't feel led by the Holy Spirit to do a sermon on one of the other sentences that are fairly long in Ephesians. And if they want help, I'd be more than willing to give them help on that too. Paul starts verse 3 with blessed, or the NIV says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's Old Testament roots are on display here. It is very common in the Old Testament for the Hebrew writers to break out in praise of God. Notice that Paul starts his praise by addressing God as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this opening, we see Paul is already introducing two of the three persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. He will get to introducing the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, excuse me, at the end of this passage. Paul continues by telling us that in Christ, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. It is important that we recognize that our blessings are spiritual ones, not necessarily uh, physical ones. There might be some things that we would desire. For example, when I lived in California, I often thought, and Wyoming has shown me the folly of my thought here, I often thought that it would be nice for God to bless me with a Porsche Carrera, or Porsche 911 Carrera, and if he really wanted to add that little extra blessing, it would come in candy apple bread, of course, and it would be turbocharged. You know, after all, I want a vehicle that can go 200 miles an hour and still be street legal. That type of material, or that type of blessing, a material one, is not in view here. But what Paul wants us to understand is that we have 
all the spiritual blessings. As I was reviewing a commentary written by Professor Patsia, he points out the difference between spiritual blessings and material blessings by turning to the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. In that sermon, our Lord points out that we should not store up earthly treasures where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves steal. But instead, we should be storing up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot steal. Paul has been telling us that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing when we accept Christ. The issue isn't, are we being blessed by God? The question is, are we availing ourselves of these gifts that God is giving us? In verse 4, Paul reminds us that God has chosen us in Christ before the creation of the world. The fact that we are chosen in Christ and that this selection occurred prior to the creation of the world demonstrates that Christ was pre-existing. Even before the world was made, Christ existed. We see God at the beginning of creation say, let us create, and then a whole bunch of other things that God was creating. As we read this, let us create, the question sometimes is asked, who is this us? With Christ being pre-existent, it is easy to see that when God the Father says, let us, he is including the Son and possibly even the Holy Spirit in this creation and this discussion. Also, think for a moment about the opening of the Gospel of John, when it declares that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Paul, like John in his opening of his Gospel, is emphasizing that Christ existed even before the beginning of the world, along with the Father. Also, the fact that we were selected even before the beginning of time indicates that this plan of salvation that we see in the New Testament, this plan of salvation through faith in Jesus, was not an afterthought nor was it a plan B when plan A failed. God knew from before the beginning of time that this event would take place and that, and that occurred before there was even an earth for us to live on. One question that may come to our mind as we consider the fact that God has chosen us is why did he choose us? The answer is found starting on the second part of verse 4. We are chosen in order to be holy and blameless. This week, I finished reading the book of Leviticus as part of a daily devotion plan that, if I follow it, should result in me reading through the Bible in one year. I'll let you know in December how that turned out. However, as I went through Leviticus, I understand why my Old Testament professors always go and say, if you have somebody reading through the Bible, if they can get through Leviticus, that's pretty good. And then comes Numbers, and Numbers is the graveyard of most plans to read through the Bible in one year. It is indeed, Leviticus is a hard book indeed to read. After all, it has all those regulations about sacrificing animals that no longer apply to us. But as you go through uh, Leviticus, there are two things that are very clear in that book. First, you notice that the animals that were to be sacrificed were to be without blemish. The second thing that you see quite often in Leviticus is 
is that God calls us to be holy because He is holy. Notice in the two path or verses that John read in Leviticus 11, God twice tells us to be holy because He is holy. We will see this command stated three more times in the book of Leviticus. And also, don't think, oh, that's Old Testament, because here in the New Testament, in Ephesians 4, we see Paul telling us to be holy. And then in Peter's first letter, he also issues the call to be holy because God is holy. In verse 5, which I believe should actually start with the last two words found in verse 4, the two words being in love, but again, that's another issue, let the academics debate that issue. We are told we were predestined to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ. Now, predestination is one of those concepts that is legitimately debated among Christian circles. Uh, last night, or yesterday morning, I had, was at a prayer breakfast uh, sponsored by Pastor Gene with the uh, community church up there. And uh, the Pat Lutheran pastor, Pastor Randy, and I were sitting, and we got into a discussion on predestination. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to go into a detailed discussion of all the pros and cons of predestination. However, I do want to spend just a few moments briefly addressing this issue because you'll hear it come up quite a bit. The quick summary is that there are two major camps in this predestination battle. And of course, like anything else, if you have two camps, then you have subgroups of each camp that believe something slightly different. So I'm just going to brush in very broad detail here. The first camp, led by John Calvin, who is one of the founders of the Presbyterian Church, declares that God has predestined some people to be saved. Calvin points out that we have done nothing to merit this selection. Our salvation is achieved only through grace. The second group, usually called the Arminians, emphasize that human free will has a role in the salvation process. After all, we have the choice to either accept or reject God's grace. Rather than seeing God as arbitrarily choosing that some of us will be saved, we are given that choice to accept Jesus as Lord or Savior or to reject Him. There is enough scripture passages to support both camps in this argument. And I am indebted to my professor, Professor Arpatia, once again, because in his commentary, he suggests that the best way to deal with the predestination theory is to realize that our election simply affirms that personal faith rests upon the prior works of God known as grace. We are free to choose God only because God has already decided to make adoption into being part of the family of God available to us through faith in Christ. Furthermore, wherever we land on the role of predestination versus free will, we should not let our, the fact that we are saved lead us to complacency because we have been chosen in order to be holy and unblemished and which, as verse, state, verse 6 states, results in our reflecting the praise of God's glorious grace. We are saved to bring glory to God. We cannot just say we're saved and we're done and that's it. In verses 7 through 10, 
we are given a list of benefits that the believers receive through God's lavishing of His grace upon us. First and foremost, we receive redemption through Christ's blood and forgiveness of sins. As I mentioned earlier, as we read through the Old Testament, and in Leviticus in particular, we see that in order to receive forgiveness, blood must be shed, and the animal being sacrificed must be without blemish. In Christ, we have the perfect sacrifice that pays the redemption price required to free us from the slavery of sin. Then as we move on to verse 8, we see that as a result of God's lavishness, we are now given all wisdom and understanding of the mystery of God's will that will be put into effect when the time has reached its fulfillment. God's will is to put all things, both in heaven and on earth, together, united under Christ. If you want more details about this plan of uniting, remember last month we uh, looked at 1 Corinthians 15 and had that as our five-week Lenten series. You can find more information about this plan in 1 Corinthians 15. In verses 12 and 13, we see once again Paul returning to the fact that we are saved in order to praise God's glory. Some of you might remember a while back, I used the Westminster Shorter Catechism, or at least some of the questions of that catechism, for our call to worship, and then would follow that up with a few sermons based on the catechism. If you have good memories, you might remember that the first question in the Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? In other words, why are we here on earth? The answer to that question is that we are here to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Paul in verses 12 and 13 provides evidence that indeed the chief purpose of God's people is to glorify and to praise God forever. Finally, in the last part of verse 13, and then again in verse 14, we get to Paul's mentioning of the Holy Spirit. Well, when we profess our faith in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. One of the main symbols that we gain with the uh, sacrament of baptism is that we say that in baptism, we receive a sign of the Holy Spirit. Paul points out that this Holy Spirit marks us with the seal that is a guarantee of our inheritance until we gain possession of eternal life. Once again, we see the Apostle, after telling us what we receive from God, this time receiving of the Holy Spirit, we, we see Paul saying, the reason why we receive the Holy Spirit is so that we can glorify God. As we come to the end of this one massive sent or this one sentence doxology given by Paul, what are the key points that we need to remember? First, we need to remember that God is to be praised for all that He has done. Next, those of us who have professed our faith in Christ have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. The question is not, are we blessed? But the true question is, are we using the blessings we have been given? And then finally, we need to remember that the reason we have been blessed is so that we can reflect God's glory by being holy and without blemish. May we go into this dark world reflecting the light and the glory of the one 
who has saved us by his grace. Amen. Amen. I would